Hey, hey, everybody. H Dub here with chapter five of Brave New World. Uh, last, last time we left off with uh, Bernard and Hemholtz Watson having a chat. Um, and, and both of them kind of seem like they are outsiders a little bit. Um, Bernard, for a very different reason than Hemholtz. Uh, Bernard is an, kind of an outcast because of his physical stature. He's not uh, the, the typical alpha plus. Um, he's got the brains of an alpha, but he doesn't have the physique of an alpha. Um, and that's, uh, and then that presents a problem in that society because, uh, alphas are seen, um, literally seen <laughs> as, as like, uh, you know, a higher, uh, form of existence than the other ones. So, uh, he has to like look eye to eye with, um, some of the lower castes and that's, that's a problem. Uh, and, but also he just feels like he's not, he's not part of everything else. And that, that really comes true. Uh, in chapter five here. Um, we also uh, met Hemholtz Watson, and Hemholtz uh, is just a, a physical specimen. I mean, he's like the perfect human. Um, the problem with that is that he also has the smarts of a pers perfect human, uh, and so he's like starting to outsmart himself, uh, and he's starting to, to, at least in chapter four, he was starting to kind of question, what, what's, what's the point of all this, right? I'm so good at writing these things, but there's like, there's no meaning behind them, and maybe I could write something else. Um, because he's because he's brilliant, and he feels like there's there's more to it uh, than he's providing for the world. Uh, and then uh, so we left off with Bernard kind of having a moment of paranoia, hearing something outside his door, and then like throwing open the door, like, <gasps> and then nobody's there, right? And then at that point, that's where the uh, chapter ends with Hemholtz being like, "Yeah, I wish he would kind of take some more pride in himself because he's kind of pathetic." Uh, all right, <clears throat> chapter five gets us introduced to a couple of other uh, societal norms. Uh, for, and it's in two, two, two uh, phases. Again, you get the first section here, and then subsection two happens later on, uh, about halfway down the screen, if you were to scroll down. Uh, and then in subsection, so it's subsec first subsection, Lenina and Henry Foster kind of show us what leisure is like uh, and what, what a date might look like uh, in this society. And then Bernard uh, goes to a very bizarre uh, community feel uh, it's it's a it's a sing song thing. It's like a church. It's almost it kind of feels to me when I read it. Feels like a like a you know a church service, uh, but like uh, on the cult side of the church service. Um, but we'll see that when we get there. It's bizarre, um, and uh, and Bernard helps us understand just how bizarre it is. Also, uh, a unibrow makes uh, an appearance in this chapter, which is always neat uh, when an <laughs> when an author uh, dials in that particular detail. Uh, so I kind of chuckle about that. So, all right, here we go. Uh, chapter five. And again, I, I try to keep the voices the same, but if they're different, I apologize. Um, I'm just one man and I'm not classically trained in theater, uh, or oral reading. I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a dumb English teacher. Uh, all right. So here we go. Chapter five. <clears throat> By eight o'clock, the light was failing. The loudspeaker in the tower of the Stoke Poges Club clubhouse began in a more than human tenor to announce the closing of the courses. Lenina and Henry abandoned their game and walked back to the club. From the grounds of the internal and external secretion trust came the lowing of those thousands of cattle which provided, with their hormones and their milk, the raw materials for the great factory at Farm Royal. An incessant buzzing of helicopters filled the twilight. Every two and a half minutes, a bell and the screech of whistles announced the departure of one of the light monorail trains, which carried the lower caste golfers back to their separate course to the metropolis. Lenina and Henry climbed into their machine and started off. At 800 feet, Henry slowed down the helicopter screws, and they hung for a minute or two poised above the fading landscape. The forest of Burnham beaches stretched like a great pool of darkness towards the bright shore of the western sky. Crimson at the horizon, the last of the sunset faded, the orange upwards into yellow and a pale watery green. Northwards, beyond, the, beyond and above the trees, the internal and external secretions factory glared with a fierce electric brilliance from every window of its twenty stories. Beneath them lay the buildings of the golf club the huge lower caste barracks, and, on the other side of the dividing wall, the smaller houses reserved for Alpha and Beta members. The approaches to the monorail station were black with the ant-like pollution of lower caste activity. From under the glass vault, a lighted train shot out into the open. Following its southeasterly course, across the dark plain, their eyes were drawn to the majestic buildings of the Slough Crematorium. For the safety of night-flying planes, its four tall chimneys were flooded, floodlighted and tipped with crimson danger signals. It was a landmark. Why do the smokestacks have those things like balconies around them? inquired Lenina. Phosphorus recovery, explained Henry telegraphically. 
On the way up the chimney, the gases go through four separate treatments. Uh, PTO5 used to go right out of circulation every time they cremated someone. Now they recover over 98% of it, uh, more than a kilo and a half per adult corpse, which makes the best part 400 tons of phosphorus every year from England alone. Henry spoke with a happy pride, rejoicing wholeheartedly in the achievement as though it had been his own. Fine to think we can go, along, go on being socially useful even after we're dead, and then making plants grow. Lenina, meanwhile, had turned her eyes away and was looking perpendicularly downward at the monorail station. Fine, she agreed, but queer that alphas and betas won't make any more plants grow than those nasty little gammas and deltas and epsilons down there. All men are uh, uh, physico-chemically equal, said Henry sententiously. Besides, even epsilon perform indispensable services. Even an epsilon. Lenina suddenly remembered an occasion when, as a little girl at school, she had woken up in the middle of the night and became aware for the first time of the whispering that had haunted all her sleeps. She saw again the beam of moonlight, the row of small white beds, heard once more the soft, soft voice that said, the words were there, unforgotten, unforgettable after so many night-long repetitions, everyone works for everyone else. You can't do without anyone. Even epsilons are useful. You couldn't do without epsilons. Everyone works for everyone else. You can't do without anyone. Lenina remembered her first shock of fear and surprise, her speculations through half a wakeful hour, and then under the influence of those endless repetitions, the gradual soothing of her mind, the soothing, the smoothing, the stealthy creeping of sleep. I suppose epsilons don't really mind being epsilons, she said out loud. Of course they don't. How can they? They don't know what it's like being anything else. We'd mind, of course, but then we've been differently conditioned. And besides, we start with a different heredity. Glad I'm not an Epsilon, said Lenina, with conviction. And if you were an Epsilon, said Henry, your conditioning would have made you no less thankful that you weren't a Beta or an Alpha. He put his forward propeller into gear and headed the machine down towards London. Behind them, in the west, the crimson and orange were almost faded. A dark bank of cloud had crept into the zenith. As they flew over the crematorium, the plane shot upwards on the column of hot air rising from the chimney, only to fall as suddenly when it passed into the descending chill beyond. What a marvelous switchback! Lenina laughed delightedly. But Henry's tone was almost for a moment melancholy. You know what that switchback was? He said. It was some human being finally and definitely disappearing, going up in a sort of hot gas. It would have been it would be curious to know who it was, a man or a woman, an alpha or a epsilon. He sighed. Then in a resolutely cheerful voice. Anyhow, he concluded, there's one thing we can be certain of. Whoever he may have been, he was happy when he was alive. And everybody's happy now. Yes. Everybody's happy now, echoed Lenina. They heard the words repeated 150 times every night for 12 years. And just let me pause there and, uh, and insert my own editorial here. Uh, man, that is kind of an important um, theme as we go through this thing. Uh, something that I'd love for you guys to continue to ask yourselves as you read this novel, uh, which is, what, first of all, what is happiness? How is it created? Uh, and is an emptiness of worry actually equated to happiness, right? Uh, just if, if you remove all the worry of the, of the world, does that then by nature create happiness? I'm not sure. I'm not convinced that it does based on this book. Um, but anyway, consider that, right? Like what, what is it that makes you happy? Uh, and and if, you, if you take that to the extreme, like dystopian novels do, like we talked about, uh, is the, are there some, some cautionary tales uh, in, in that idea of, of happiness is just being the, like the absence of any kind of worry or any kind of responsibility like that? That uh, I think some of us are looking for that, uh, and so this this uh, this novel is great for a check on that idea. Landing on the roof of Henry's forty-story apartment house in Westminster, they went straight down the dining hall. There, in a loud and cheerful company, they ate an excellent meal. Soma was served with a coffee. Lenina took two half-gram tablets, and Henry three. At Twenty past nine, they walked across the street to the newly opened Westminster Abbey cabaret. It was a night almost without clouds, moonless and starry. But of this, on the whole depressing fact, Lenina and Henry were fortunately unaware. The electric sky signs effectively shut out the outer darkness. Calvin Stopes and his 16 saxophonists. That's saxophonists. Yeah, you read that right. From the facade of the new abbey, the giant letters invitingly glared, London's finest scent and color organ, all the latest synthetic music. They entered. The air seemed hot and somehow breathless with the scent of ambergris and sandalwood. On the domed ceiling of the hall, the colored organ had momentarily painted the tropical sunset. The sixteen saxophonists were playing an old favorite. There ain't no bottle in all the world like that dear bottle of mine. 
Four hundred couples were five-stepping around the polished floor. Lenina and Henry were soon the four hundred and first. The saxophonists wailed like melodious cats under the moon, moaned in the alto and tenor registers as though the little death were upon them. Rich with a wealth of harmonics, their tremulous chord chorus mounted toward a climax, louder and even louder, until at last, with a wave of his hand, the conductor let loose the final shattering note of ether music and blew the sixteen and blew the sixteen merely human blowers clean out of existence. Thunder in A flat minor. And then, in all but silence, in all but darkness, there followed a gradual deturgescence, a diminuendo, sliding gradually through the quarter tones down, down to a faintly whispered dominant chord that lingered on while the five four rhythms still pulsed low, charging the darkened seconds with an intense expectancy. And at last, expectancy was fulfilled. There was a sudden explosive sunrise, and simultaneously the sixteen burst into song. Bottle of mine, it's you I've always wanted. Bottle of mine, why was I ever decanted? Skies are, bl and are blue inside of you, the weather's always fine, for there ain't no bottle in all the world like that dear bottle of mine. I think that's a play on an actual song, There Ain't No Baby Like Mine, uh, or Ain't No Woman Like Mine, something like that. Anyway, you guys can look it up, or don't, because nobody's listening to this anyway, so there's that. <clears throat> Five-stepping with the other 400 and round, and round Westminster Abbey, Lenina and Henry were yet dancing in another world. The warm, the richly colored, the infinitely friendly world of Soma Holiday. How kind, how good-looking, how delightfully amusing everyone was. Bottle of mine, it's you I've always wanted. But Lenina and Henry had what they wanted. They were inside, here and now, safely inside with the fine weather, the perennially blue sky. And when exhausted, the sixteen had laid by their saxophones, and the synthetic music apparatus was producing the very latest and slow Malthusian blues. They might have been twin embryos, gently rocking together on the waves of the bottled ocean of blood surrogate. Good night, dear friends. Good night, dear friends. The loudspeakers veiled their commands in a genial and musical politeness. Good night, dear friends. Obediently, with all the others, Lenina and Henry left the building. The depressing stars had traveled quite some way across the heavens, but though the separating screen of the sky signs had now to be to a great extent dissolved, the two young people still retained their happy ignorance of the night. Swallowing half an hour before closing time, that second dose of Soma had raised a quite impenetrable wall between the actual universe and their minds. Bottled, they crossed the street. Bottled, they took the lift up to Henry's room on the 28th floor, and yet bottled as she was, and in spite of that second gram of Soma, Lenina did not forget to take all the contraceptive precautions prescribed by the regulators, or regulations. Years of intensive hypnopedia, and from 12 to 16, Malthusian drill three times a week had made the taking of these precautions almost as automatic as and inevitable as blinking. Oh, that reminds me, said, she said, as she came back from the bathroom. Fanny Crown wants to know where you found that lovely green Morocco surrogate cartridge belt you gave me. Subsection 2 of Chapter 5 Alternate Thursdays were Bernard's Solidarity Service Days. After an early dinner at the Aphroditium, to which Hemholtz had recently been elected under Rule 2, he took leave of the, his friend and, hailing a taxi on the roof, told the man to fly to the Fordson Community Singery. The machine rose a couple of hundred meters, then headed eastwards, as it, and as it turned, there before Bernard's eyes, gigantically beautiful, was the Singery. Floodlighted, its 320 meters of white Carrera surrogate gleamed with a snowy incandescence over Ludgate Hill. At each of the four corners of its helicopter platform, an immense T shone crimson against the night, and from the mouths of twenty-four vast golden trumpets rumbled a solemn synthetic music. Damn, I'm late, Bernard said to himself as he first caught sight of Big Henry, the singery clock. <laughs> it's not old old Ben, right? It's not old Ben, it's, it's Big Henry. Henry Ford, old Ben. That's so funny. Ford sang out an immense bass voice from all the golden trumpets. Ford, Ford, Ford. Nine times, Bernard ran for the lift. The great auditorium for Ford's Day celebrations and other masks community sings was at the bottom of the building. Above it, a hundred to each floor were the 7,000 rooms used by solidarity, solidarity groups for their fortnight services. Bernard dropped down to floor 33, hurried along the corridor, stood hesitating for a moment outside room 3210, then, having wound himself up, opened the door, and walked in. Thank Ford he was not the last. Three chairs of the twelve arranged around the circular table were still unoccupied. 
He slipped into the nearest of them as inconspicuously as he could and prepared to frown at the yet later comers whenever they should arrive. Turning towards him, What were you playing this afternoon? The girl on his left inquired. Obstacle or electromagnetic? Bernard looked at her. Ford, it was Morgana Rothschild. And, and blushingly had to admit that he had been playing either. Morgana stared at him, at, stared at him with astonishment. There was an awkward silence. Then, pointedly, she turned away and addressed herself to the more sporting man on her left. Good beginning for a solidarity service, thought Bernard miserably, and foresaw for himself yet another failure to achieve atonement. If only he had given himself time to look around instead of scuttling for the nearest chair. He could have sat between Fifi Bradlaugh and Joanna Diesel, instead of which he had gone and blindly planted himself next to Morgana. Morgana. Fork, those black eyebrows of hers. That eyebrow, rather, for they met above the nose. Ford. And on his right was Clara Dieterding. True, Clara's eyebrows didn't meet, but she really was too pneumatic, whereas Fifi and Joanna were absolutely right. Plump, blonde, not too large. And it was that look, that great lout, Tom Kawaguchi, who now took the seat between them. The last arrival was Saragini Engels. You're late, said the president of the group severely. Don't let it happen again. Sarah Jeannie apologized and slid into her place between Jim Bokanovsky and Herbert Backman. The group was now complete. The solidarity circle perfect and without flaw. Man, woman, man, in a ring of endless alternation round the table. Twelve of them ready to be made one, waiting to come together, to be fused, to lose their twelve separate entity, identities in a larger being. The psychological term for that is de-individuation. When you lose your, uh, your personality or your individualness, or individuality uh, is the actual word for that. So yeah, that's uh, the psychological term when you uh, when you intentionally go and then like lose your your individuality in, in a group. That's the individuation. How about that? The president stood up, made the sign of the T, and switching on the synthetic music, let loose the soft, indefatigable beating of drums and a choir of instruments, near wind and super string, that plangently repeated and repeated the brief and unescapably haunting melody of the first solidarity hymn. Again, again, and it was not the ear that heard the pulsing rhythm, it was the midriff. The wail and clang of those recurring harmonies haunted, not the mind, but the yearning bowels of compassion. The president made another sign of the tea and sat down. The service had begun. Dedicated Soma tablets were placed in the center of the table. The loving cup of strawberry ice cream Soma was passed from hand to hand, and with the formula, drink to my annihilation, 12 times quaffed. Then, to the accompaniment of the synthetic orchestra, the first solidarity hymn was sung. Ford, we are twelve, oh, make us one. Like drops within the social river, oh, make us now together run, as swiftly as thy shining flipper. Twelve yearning stanzas, and then the loving cup was passed a second time. I drink to the greater being, was now the formula. All drank, tirelessly the music played, the drums beat, the crying and clashing of harmonies were an obsession in the melted bowels. The second solidarity hymn was sung. Come, greater being, social friend, annihilating twelve and one, we long to die, for when we end, our larger life has but begun. Again, twelve stanzas, but this time the soma had begun to work. Eyes shone, cheeks were flushed, the inner light of universal benevolence broke out on every face in happy, friendly smiles. Even Bernard felt himself a little melted. When Morgana Rothschild turned and beamed at him, he did his best to beam back. But the eyebrow, that black two and one, Alas, it was still there. He couldn't ignore it, couldn't, however hard he tried. The melting hadn't gone far enough. Perhaps if he had been sitting between Fifi and Joanna, for the third time the loving cup went round. I drink to the imminence of his coming, coming said Morgana Rothschild, whose turn it happened to be to initiate the circular rite. Her tone was loud, exultant. She drank and passed the cup to Bernard. I drink to the imminence of his coming, he repeated with a sincere attempt to feel that the coming was imminent. But the eyebrow continued to haunt him, and the coming so far as he was concerned, was horribly remote. He drank and handed the cup to Clara Dieterding. It'll be a failure again, he said to himself. I know it will. But he went on doing his best to, to beam. The loving cup has made it, had made its circuit. Lifting his head, the president gave a single. The chorus broke out into the third solidarity hymn. Feel how the great being comes. Rejoice, and in rejoicings die. Melt in the music of the drums, for I am you, and you are I. A verse succeeded verses. As verse succeeded verse, the voices thrilled with an ever intenser excitement. The sense of the coming's imminence was like an electrotension in the air. 
president switched off the music, and with the final note of the final stanza, there was absolute silence. A silence of stretched expect expectancy, quivering and creeping with a galvanic life. The president reached out his hand, and suddenly a voice, a deep, strong voice, more musical than any nearly human voice, richer, warmer, more vibrant with love and yearning and compassion, a wonderful, mysterious, supernatural voice spoke from above their heads, very slowly. Oh, Ford, 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 he said diminishingly on a descending scale. A sensation of warmth radiated thrillingly out from the solar plexus to every extremity of the bodies of those who listened. Tears came into their eyes. Their hearts, their bowels seemed to move within them as though with an independent life. Ford, they were melting. Ford, dissolve, dissolve. Then, in another tone, suddenly, startlingly, listen, trumpeted the voice. Listen, to listen. A pause sunk to a whisper, but a whisper somehow more penetrating than the loudest cry. The feet of the greater being, it went on and repeated the words. The feet of the greater being, these were almost expired. The feet of the greater being are on the stairs. And once more there was silence, and the expectancy momentarily relaxed was stretched again, totter, totter, almost to the tearing point. The feet of the greater being, oh, they heard them, they heard them coming softly down the stairs, coming nearer and nearer down the invisible stairs, the feet of the greater being, and suddenly the tearing point was reached. Her eyes staring, her lips parted, Morgana Rothschild sprang to her feet. I hear him, she cried. I hear him. He's coming, shouted Sarjoni L. Ingalls. Yes, he's coming. I hear him. Fifi Bradlaugh and Tom Kawagashi rose simultaneously, simultaneously to their feet. Oh, oh, Joanna inart inarticulately testified. He's coming yelled Jim Bokanofsky. The president leaned forward and, with a touch, released a delirium of cymbals and blown brass, a fever of tom-tumming. Oh, he's coming, screamed Clara Dietering. Ay, it was as though her, she was having her throat cut. Feeling that it was time for him to do something, Bernard also jumped up and shouted, I hear him, he's coming. But it wasn't true. He heard nothing, and for him, nobody was coming. Nobody. In spite of the music, in spite of the mounting excitement. But he waved his arms, he shouted with the best of them, and when the others began to jig and stamp and shuffle, he also jigged and shuffled. Round they went, a circular procession of dancers, each with hands on the hips of the dancer, preceding round and round, shouting in unison, stamping to the rhythm of the music with their feet, beating it, beating it out with hands on the buttocks in front, twelve pairs of hands beating as one, as one, twelve buttocks slabbily resounding. Twelve as one, twelve as one. I hear him, I hear him coming! The music quickened, faster beat the the feet faster, faster fell the rhythmic hands, and all at once a great synthetic bass boomed out the words which announced the approaching atonement, the final consummation of solidarity. Coming, the twelve and one, the incarnation of the greater being. Porgy porgy, it sang, while the tom-toms continued to beat their feverish tattoo. Porgy porgy, ford and fun, kiss the girls and make them one. Boy at one, boys at one with girls at peace, orgy porgy gives release. Orgy porgy, the dancers caught up and up the liturgical refrain. Orgy porgy, forward and fun, kiss the girls. And as they sang, the lights began slowly to fade, to fade, and at the same time to grow warmer, richer, redder, till at last they were dancing in the crimson twilight of an embryo store. Orgy porgy, in their blood-colored and fetal darkness, the dancers continued for a while to circulate, to beat and beat out the indefatigable rhythm. Orgy porgy, then the circle wavered, broke fell in partial disintegration on the ring of couches when, which surrounded circle and closing circle the table and its planetary chairs. Orgy porgy, tenderly the deep voice cooned and cooed. In the red, red twilight it was as though some enormous negro dove were hovering benevolently over the now prone and supine dancers. They were standing on the roof. Big Henry had just sung eleven. The night was calm and warm. Isn't that wonderful? said Beefy Bradlaugh. Wasn't it simply wonderful? She looked at Bernard with an expression of rapture, but of rapture in which there was no trace of agitation or excitement. For to be excited is still to be unsatisfied. Hers was the calm ecstasy of achieved consummation, the, the peace, not of mere vacant, vacant satiety and nothingness, but of balanced life, of energies at rest and in equilibrium. A rich and living peace. The solidarity service had given, as well as taken, drawn off only to replenish. She was full was made perfect. She was still more than merely herself. Didn't you think it was wonderful, she insisted, looking into Bernard's face with those supernaturally shining eyes. Yes, I, I thought it was wonderful, he lied and looked away. The sight of her transfigured face was at once an accusation and an ironical reminder of his own separateness. 
He was as miserably isolated now as he had been when the service began, more isolated by reason of his unreplenished emptiness, his dead satiety. Separate and unatoned, while the others were being fused into the greater being, alone even in Morgana's embrace, much more alone indeed, more hopelessly himself than he had ever been in his life before. He had imagined from that crimson twilight into the common electric glare with a common with a self-consciousness intensified to the pitch of agony. He was utterly miserable, and perhaps, her shining eyes accused him, perhaps it was his own fault. Quite wonderful, he repeated. The only thing he could think of was Morgana's eyebrow. It's a great way to leave the chapter right there. The <laughs> only thing you could think of was Morgana's eyebrows. It almost has like that tinge of like Edgar Allan Poe, right? Where the dude like focuses on one thing, right? I'm thinking of uh, that story uh, titled Berenice, uh, where he focuses on like her teeth. Um, anyway, uh, there's that. Chapter five in the books. Uh, ha ha, in the books. Uh, all right. We'll see you next time for chapter six is up next. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.